Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the ISS. My name is Eric Pelser. I'm the head of the ENAC program here at the Institute for Security Studies. I see there's some new faces. Welcome to those people who first time uh, at the ISS. We hope that you find this interesting and that you come again. A special welcome, is, of course, to uh, Ariane Labad uh, uh, from the U European Union delegation, who has recently arrived in South Africa and um, has agreed to join us here on her arrival. Thanks very much. I'm also very pleased to see, of course, um, representatives from a number of uh, counterpart groups, uh, particularly the African Pangolin Working Group, Endangered Wildlife Trust. I see some people from Traffic, uh, Pangolins in Africa. I think I saw somebody from USAID as well, but welcome to the donor delegation. A special welcome, of course, to our, our, our keynote speakers, uh, who I'm going to introduce now. There's Professor Ray Janssen, who's the chairperson of the African Pangolin Working Group. Uh, we have Marie Denk Dickman, the founder of the Rare and Endangered Species Trust, and we have Fani Musango, who's come from over from Parting Nature Conservation. Thank you very much for, for taking the time to come and join us today. <coughs> uh, also, a special welcome for our online audience. I understand that we have uh, people tuned in on the net from 10 African countries. <coughs> welcome, welcome, everybody, to this event. Our seminar today, of course, is sponsored by the ENAC program, uh, which is an EU-funded program. Um, <coughs> which is uh, implemented together with Interpol and the Global Initiative Against Organized Crime. That program, of course, is uh, an acronym for exactly that. We hope through seminars like this and our research work to elicit a response to particular forms of organized crime based on field and evidence-based policy recommendations. And I think for me, that's likely to be the strength of this seminar today, that we've done the field work, we've spoken to the experts, and now we're coming to get input from others in the field about what it is we should do about this, uh, this crime. <coughs> I'd just like to say one thing. You, we have our website is up and functioning, and you can see all the other issues that the NAC program looks like. Our new flagship product, for those who don't know, is an organized crime index um, that's just gone live in the last month. It was launched at the United Nations General Assembly uh, on the 24th of September. And it is an African-based index which gives you a rating around criminal markets and the response of the states in all of Africa's countries. That index is meant to um, solicit this kind of response, an engagement by uh, civil society, CSOs, uh, and other counterparts, the donor communities, particularly in addressing organized crime. So you're welcome, and I encourage you to take a look at that. Today, though, we're talking about pangolins. Um, we are all very aware of the research and the advocacy and the lobbying about our big species, particularly rhino and our lions. Um, too little attention in our mind has been placed to the, the issue of pangolin smuggling and the death of these of the species, largely for hunted down, trafficked largely for their scales in the meat uh, in South Asia. So that's the purpose of our discussion. We, we know too that there are very many other organizations that are deeply involved in this issue. And our, our approach is not to duplicate that work, but rather to complement it, to, do, to take what others have done, to work with them, to, to build a network, uh, an advocacy and lobbying group with government agencies and others to, to, to elicit a response to this. What is it that we can do and how we should go about doing that? And I think that's exactly what Richard has done in his policy. <coughs> um, <coughs> He's taken a look at what the current strategies are, uh, some of the gaps in those strategies, and then through discussion with uh, other counterparts, uh, has come up with a set of recommendations. One of, our, one of our purposes here today is to test, stress test those recommendations to see their applicability, their plausibility, and how best to go about implementing those, because ultimately what we'd like to do is to disrupt this market, uh, if not end it entirely. Um, and I think this is the this is the start of what could be a longer term project that, that works solely in this field. Um, so Richard and, and, uh, and the other respondents will discuss many of these issues in detail. Um, and I think uh, we have a, a sufficiently informed and very, very experienced panel that, that will take you through it. And I hope that um, in our Q&A session that we are all able to engage with, these, with the issues that are raised, specifically around the recommendations and the implementation. So that's it from me. Um, welcome again to the ISS, to our guest speakers, to all the people here. And I'd like to hand over to uh, Ariane Labard from the European delegation to make a few opening remarks. Thank you for coming. Thanks, Eric. Uh, 
Thanks very much, Sawubona, colleagues. Um, hello to the, the counterparts that are listening to us from the rest of Africa. It's very impressive that we are together uh, in this discussion. And, and really, from the EU side, I wish to express how much we are proud to support this ENAC project because it's continental and it's <coughs> addressing a, a growing threat from trans transnational organized crime. And the approach of ENACT of creating awareness, producing evidence-based knowledge, building skills, we really believe it's going to deliver a lot of results. We know organized crimes, it knows no border, it threatens our governance, our global peace uh, and development um, achievements, uh, because it fuels conflicts and triggers violence. And we know that the effect of this organized crime are global, but they are felt also very deeply in communities um, and in southern Africa gr in a growing manner. So, an act by being committed uh, to profile the issue of transnational organized crime uh, is reflecting <coughs> Africa's efforts and Africa's challenges and Africa's solution. So, I'm, I'm really grateful to be here today to discuss that with you and especially zooming in on the pongolin trafficking. So from the research that ENACT is producing, we know that uh, wildlife crime has been a growing environmental threat and security threat for this region. From the EU side, uh, we have a dedicated action plan against wildlife trafficking and the core of that plan is to emphasize the working relationship with the partner countries to find solutions <coughs> that works locally. Um, also, from the EU perspective, of course, we are extremely engaged in the international convention, like the Convention on International Trade and Endangered Species, the CITES, where um, the commercial trade in pangolins has been prohibited since 2016. However, clearly, the, the research that we're going to learn more about today shows there is a growing illicit trade in, in, uh, pangolin, tra uh, in pangolin meat and scales. And this is compounded by some strategies or legislation or lack of awareness that we, we need to, to look into today. Um, even if um, pangolin trafficking in Southern Africa may be still relatively low compared to other African regions, um, the research um, is showing that this is changing. And, and we need to turn to our attention. Um, I want to highlight that um, in the EU we are working also on the demand side. We have a very active partnership with our colleagues uh, in China and in Asia to look at how we can also work on, on the demand front. And we want to link up today. The, the main reason why I'm here today, sent by my colleagues also from headquarters, is really to listen how we can connect the dots between what we are doing on the demand side and how we can address here um, illicit crime. Um, so also I want to not just uh, mention the, the gloomy picture of this growing crime, I also want to highlight that from the EU side we want to promote um, the opportunities for a better deal for people and nature to prosper. Uh, that's where, why we are going uh, together with our South African counterparts into the negotiation of the Convention for Biodiversity next year and aiming to have a very ambitious and realistic uh, new deal for nature and people next year in the CBD negotiations. In Europe, we try to do our homework. Uh, in our nature legislation, we have our own action plan for nature, people and the economy, where really we emphasize the business case, uh, trying to reach out to all stakeholders, um, not just working with legislation, but also with partnerships on the ground. And I'm, I'm really grateful that today we are also taking this approach of um, multi-stakeholder um, st strengthening of our efforts to combat um, trafficking of pangolin. I want finally to mention that just next week, um, we, are, we have uh, here in South Africa the session of the African Ministerial Conference on Environment uh, that is also about taking action for environmental sustainability and prosperity in Africa. And we will be having um, a, a bilateral meeting between South Africa and EU authorities at the highest level to discuss what we can do together to protect better biodiversity. Um, so I don't want to uh, take too long, um, but I, I really want to highlight that uh, we are looking forward to the recommendation from ENACT Research. Uh, as I said, to take um, it ahead in our discussion with uh, South African partners, with African partners in general, and uh, globally with um, the, the Asian partners who are fighting 
the demand. We really look forward to the, your practical recommendations um, and to continuing the collaboration with you. Thanks so much. Uh, good morning, everyone. Welcome uh, to those present here and to our uh, panelists and to the online audience. Uh, first off, I would like to say that there's been a slight change in the program. Um, what was originally meant to have two sessions is going to be combined into one. So that means you get to leave early, earlier than expected, or maybe more time for questions and answers. Um, so having said that, uh, let us get straight to the meat of the issue. Um, first, I would like to say I stand here. Uh, I do not have a conservation background. I'm a researcher in the ENAC program. I focus on transnational organized crime, um, especially the links with uh, wildlife and natural resources. And uh, which is, I believe, it's another angle which is very important. We work in collaboration with conservation, with government, with policies and what we would often term as a multi-sectorial uh, or multi-agency collaboration. And I think unless such things happen, and unless we n not work in silos, um, better benefits can be derived and we can achieve our goal in uh, reducing and uh, combating illegal wildlife trafficking. So we start off with wildlife crimes. Um, just a brief overview, um, the reason behind the whole research was uh, we look at wildlife crime, which is the fourth largest um, global illegal trade after you have <coughs> drugs, counterfeit goods, and human trafficking. So, but it's slowly over, over, uh, overtaking, heading towards uh, the top position in that order. And uh, pangolins were specifically chosen due to its importance, uh, as emphasized uh, by uh, Ms. Uh, Ariane. And also that due to the lack of awareness around, uh, um, I'm sure if I were to ask how many of us in this room have actually seen a live pangolins, um, I don't think we will have, you know, not many of us and not many um, of the public have seen. And hence that also creates uh, a lack of awareness whereby we are not, since we can't see it, we don't know what it looks like, we don't understand how it functions in, in the, its role in the ecosystem become very difficult to protect an unknown or, as uh, Prof. Frey would term, a ghost of uh, uh, a creature. Um, just delving into the methodology of the research, it was a qualitative research. And its aim was to look at practical recommendations. So basically the aim was, what are the practical recommendations that can be put in place, that can be implemented? As we know in almost every field, um, there are very good legislation, there can be very good strategies, but the problem is always with the implementations. That could be either because maybe the recommendations are too broad, too general, or too generic. So the aim of the research was to break, into break that barrier and uh, <coughs> to come with practical recommendations, and I would ask your assistance later on in the Q&A to further strengthen some of the recommendations. Um, and for this presentation, I will look at the key findings. I will not mention all the key findings, but the predominant one, the most important one that I feel that came out of the research, and also the same will be applied to the policy recommendations. Um, I think most of you have a copy, if not all of you. Um, all the recommendations are there. There's about 18 or 20, so I won't go through each of them individually. And then uh, our speakers will further elaborate on how these uh, recommendations are practical or practical within their daily work. A brief outline of the policy brief bef uh, for those of you who do not have not opened it and read through it yet. So basically it's just an introduction, background, problem statement. So it looks at the strategies on the continent. Then it goes down to the region and then it focuses on South Africa specifically. It's looking at strategies. Uh, legislation does fit in here and there but it's mostly on strategy because we believe that strategies are more implementable, more practical and we can hit the ground running, in other words, with a strategy rather than a policies. It's faster than a policy. <coughs> so what are the key findings? The first one is, which is, with no doubt, it's wildlife crime has growingly 
become both an environmental and a security threat for the continent and the southern African region. Um, very often when we think of wildlife crime, we think, oh, it could be ivory, it could be rhino horn or pangolin scales. But more and more we've seen that transnational organized criminals not only deal with, when, whenever they deal with wildlife trafficking, you will always find either drugs, arms, or at times uh, human trafficking as well. So it's a whole combination. So we cannot look at it as a crime on its own per se, but also interlinked, especially in the growing transnational organized criminal networks. Um, the other thing that came up was that the South African government has taken wildlife crime seriously, <coughs> especially when we look at uh, rhino poaching. We've seen um, the 2014, as you would see, it was the height of the rhino poaching crisis. And this is when government looked back and was like, no, this is becoming serious. It's not only a threat to our environment, but also it's becoming a, a, a national security threat. National security threat in that like I say, it's if somebody, if a transnational organization, criminal organization deals with wildlife products, there's a likelihood that they will deal in drugs, there's a likelihood that they will deal in arms, which further and further um, threatens our security, our border security, and our national uh, security as well. So they came up with a national integrated strategy to combat wildlife trafficking, often referred to in <coughs> policy circle as the NISQIT for the abbreviation, which is a very comprehensive, one of the most comprehensive and progressive or updated strategies on combating wildlife trafficking, not only in the region, but I would say on the continent as well. Um, let's go to the pangolins. Um, it's, uh, from the research, it emerged that the last three years, we have witnessed a dramatic increase in seizures in pangolin scales globally. And uh, as you will see from the graph, uh, it has exponentially increased in the last three years. That could be based on two reasons. One, it could mean that there's been a greater demand, that pangolin scales are more in demand now. Or two, it could mean that there's been greater awareness among law enforcement officials, that now they know what a pangolin scale looks like. And uh, but prior to that, there was lack of awareness and very little was known about what a pangolin looks like, what a pangolin scale looks like, and how do you determine, how do you differentiate. And, last, and then these are the other findings. There's no specific strategy per se that addresses illicit harvesting and trafficking of pangolins. I've mentioned the Nisquit, but however, if you look deeper into the Nisquit, you'll see there's a strong emphasis on um, your megafauna, such as rhinos and elephants, but very little about the other endangered species that we are not familiar with. And the pangolins is definitely one of them. Um, as was mentioned by Ariane, um, the global trade in pangolin in Africa is exponentially big. It's very, it's disastrous for the pangolin's um, uh, population. But in South Africa, the volume of the trade in pangolins are rather in live pangolins. Most pangolins seized are live pangolins rather than scales, but that's starting to change. Um, there's also a disturbing trend in cross-border trade, specifically between Botswana, Mozambique, Zimbabwe, and South Africa, because most pangolin seized, you will see either originate from Zimbabwe or from Mozambique uh, or from Botswana. And that's partly due to, or predominantly due to the, <coughs> not the lack of legislation in South Africa, but rather the enforcement of it rather than the strict, um, for instance, uh, prior to, to last month, if you were caught with a pangolin in Zimbabwe, you would get a mandatory nine-year sentence. No question asked, you go there, nine-year. Uh, but in South Africa, it ranges, it varies. Um, it could be a suspended sentence for three, three years, like we've seen earlier this year, or it could be two years or three years, but. Uh, Prof. Ray is going to elaborate more on that in his uh, presentation. And also a disturbing trend is that criminal networks are gradually attempting to use South Africa as a hub to export pangolin scales obtained from other parts of Africa to Asia. Often they're using the same route as rhino horns. You'll find the similar syndicates that are trading in rhino horns are the ones that are dealing in pangolin scales. Very often you will see seizures where 
pangolin scales are packaged in small packages, 10 gram, 5 gram, 15 grams, which definitely say there's um, a business going on and that it's getting ready to be exported to other regions. <coughs> On the terms of strategies, um, one thing that came up was both that the LEAP and the South African Nisquid strategies place more emphasis on rhinos and elephants, your megafaunas, other than other less important species like the pangolin. It is mentioned, but in terms of responses, and um, in terms of responses, in terms of ways, it's more uh, efforts and resources are placed on rhinos and elephants, <laughs> and which brings up to, which most of you know the quotes, but I think in this aspect, it applies almost literally to the case. All animals are <laughs> equals, but some are more equal than others. On a national level, uh, we're talking more like provincial level, um, outdated legislation and different level of listings of the pangolin contribute to a confusion and uh, enables a flourishing in the illegal trade. For instance, for example, if you look at some of the legislation that are still in use, the highlighted ones, um, Eastern Cape, we've seen they still use the Cape and Nature Environmental Conservation Ordinance 19 of 74, and we've seen 19 or, uh, 15 of uh, 74 again, uh, 12 of 1983. However, there are provinces that have um, reviewed their uh, legislations and are currently in the process of uh, producing new ones. So having looked at the key findings, I'm going to now dwell briefly onto the recommendations that came out of the study. Um, <coughs> primarily, the first one would be definitely the acceleration of the process of approval and adoption of the Nisquid strategy. As most would recognize or know that we do have the strategy, but it still needs to be signed off. Basically, the difference between a strategy and a policy is that a policy has to be approved by uh, parliament and has to go through government uh, processes. So hence a strategy is the director generals of the department get to sign off, which feels it's a faster way, more efficient. However, the Nesquit is still in the process of being signed, I think about five years from later. We're still in the process of trying to get some of the DGs to sign off on the strategy. So why is it important to sign off? It's in terms of resources. It's once the strategy is signed off, then more resources can be distributed to the different departments to enable them to do their jobs with more resources at hand. But very often the big issue that comes up is lack of funding, lack of resources, lack of capacity. And if we approve this, the strategy, then definitely there will be more room for resources and for the implementation of the strategy. The other one um, is to review the remaining outdated provincial legislation, which is I think quite obvious. Um, also promoting awareness. I think that's what key that will come out of this, of the research is a lack of awareness contributes to the flourishing in <coughs> the pangolin trade. So basically it would be promoting awareness on pangolins through media campaigns, program and workshops. Um, the example I use here, we could do it with children, school children. Um, looking at, for instance, in the uh, life sciences curriculum of grade 11, you have a section that look at conservation and look at the rhinos. So one recommendation could be why not also include a pangolin there, you know, just so that they become aware at such you know, young age and understand the importance that the pangolin plays. Other recommendation <coughs> would be this, that would be more specifically with, in line with multi-agency collaboration and multi-collaboration. Uh, form partnership with the Department of Environmental Affairs and Law Enforcement to understand the difficulties and challenges faced by these agencies in dealing with wildlife crime. Very often during the interviews that I've conducted, you will find such departments say, no, we're not aware of what's happening or civil societies engaging on their own, but there's no partnership per se. Some will say, <coughs> but the law enforcement doesn't understand our problem, doesn't understand our struggles. The Department of uh, Law Enforcement will say those, um, the DEA does not understand, so there is um, a lack of partnership or collaboration, but that is changing. <coughs> so I would say a multi-agency bringing civil society on board to assist, because sometimes if I law enforcement do not have a conservation background, 
and sometimes you will find um, uh, some of uh, the DEA who do not have law enforcement background and understand the processes and things that had to take place. The other would be, um, in terms of civil society as well, would be taking into consideration donor funding and restrictions because each organization is funded differently and has different priorities and objectives that they need to achieve. But um, they could take that into consideration in dealing with wildlife crime by partnering with each other. Uh, we've seen one with the EMS and, uh, and banned animal trading who came together and put a report on can lion hunting and submitted it to parliament. And we're still getting going even though, I mean, it's still quite a long way to go, but that's some form of where um, organization can come together because very often you will find there's this territorial battle where this organization is looking at rhinos and the other one is looking at elephants and the other one is looking at another species, but they do not talk to each other. Like, no, you cannot encroach on mine because this is what I do. You don't do that. But um, I think if we put our consideration aside and come together, definitely we will, there will be a way to deal with illegal wildlife trafficking. This one will be more like, um, we have the legislation as I previously mentioned. It does provide for uh, punitive measures as we've seen the NEMBA, you get uh, 10 year sentences. But very often the imposed penalties are not strict enough. So one way, in, a, in addition to creating awareness around prosecutors and uh, lawyers and the judiciary, is maybe we can develop an investigation and prosecution manual that deals specifically with wildlife crime, where it says this is what you, these are the law that you can be charged with. Um, it also works for law enforcement for your first respondent as well, where these are the when you do a charge sheet, for instance, these are the laws that you can apply and these are the charges that you can look at. Uh, Botswana has done one, this is the example one put on the screen, and most recently Zimbabwe as well has come up with a toolkit as well. And that's one thing I would, uh, South, uh, South Africa could also learn from. And the other one would be creating um, innovative approach to creating media campaigns. I'm sure most of you have come across or heard of it, uh, The Eye of the Pangolin, uh, which was a documentary, which was quite groundbreaking, got <coughs> quite a lot of attention. And uh, these are some of the examples that could be used. And also, for those of you who catch the Khao train, I'm sure you've seen this in the Khao train, or the little logo down there. But um, these are also forms of media awareness campaigns and bringing innovative approaches to that. And also that goes back to um, civil society organization working together to come up with such um, campaigns so that together we can combat and address the issue of uh, wildlife trafficking, especially in the pangolins. So these are just brief key findings and recommendations. Um, uh, if you want to go into more detail, feel free to, you can find it in the policy brief. But for now, I'm going <coughs> to hand it over to those who have practical experience who will look at the findings, look at the recommendations, and say how this is applied <coughs> within their daily work. Um, thanks very much, uh, Richard, and um, thanks very much for the ENACT program for invi inviting me to be part of, of this process. Um, I founded the African Penguin Working Group in 2011. I'm actually an ornithologist. I know nothing about mammals. I study birds. Well, I used to. No, no longer. These things have taken over my life. Um, purely based on the horror um, that I witnessed back in 2011, of the trade in pangolins in South Africa. And um, for my sins, I had to be a teacher at one stage and go back to school, because I was a very naughty school kid. And um, one of the, the kids I taught there approached me a number of years later while I was at one of the universities here in Pretoria and asked if I could um, supervise his master's degree on uh, pangolins in the Kalahari. I said, I've never even seen one, I'd love to. And that was the beginning of the end for me. So, a number of years later, um, I'm even more passionate about these crazy animals. And um, 
I want to talk today very briefly, 15 minutes or so, about pangolins in Africa and what's going on in Africa. The African Pangolin Working Group works on all four species right through Africa, not just on the Temex ground pangolin in um, southern Africa. Uh, just a, a recap for those of you unaware, it, it, it is a mammal. Um, pangolins have one pup every year, probably closer to every two years. They're the only mammal covered <coughs> in hard overlapping keratinous scales and that's their greatest downfall. They can't even open their mouths. They've got a tongue about two thirds the length of their body. They have no teeth and they, so they edentate and they feed specifically on ants and termites. So they've got a long history, about 87 million years ago. In the supercontinent Pangaea, they evolved from a common ancestor very closely related to what is now a domestic cat. So it's quite a bizarre animal. The first penguins uh, evolved out of what is now North America into Europe and then into Asia and across in Gondwana land when Asia was joined to India, India was joined to Africa and the penguins moved over into Africa about 47 million years ago. So Asia and Africa were linked at one stage. And so you get Asian elephants, African elephants, African penguins, Asian penguins, you even get Perlamun in Asia, and you get Perlamun in Africa. Hence the problem. They ate all theirs, now they're coming for ours. <laughs> That's the truth of the matter. So, there were four, there are four species of penguins in Asia, areas such as uh, China, uh, Malaysia, Vietnam, um, and they're four in Africa. The four Asian species are becoming increasingly rare and very difficult to find. And so, just like African rhinos, African lion bone, African ivory, they're coming for African penguins. Cultural <coughs> use is the head of the snake, I'm afraid. Um, cultural use is ancient. It goes back many, many thousands of years, both in Africa and in Asia. And people are very closely linked to their culture. Just like people are closely linked to their religion, they're closely linked to their culture, and they carry their culture with them. We've seen a lot of people from, even from Africa, migrating into Europe and living in areas such as France and Sweden and Canada and North America. Their culture follows them. And we're seeing an increased level of trade in pangolins to those people who live in those countries now, because they keep very close ties to their culture. So if you've got such a huge cultural uh, value system, you're not going to stop wanting what's important to your culture. Hence rhino horn. Rhino horn, what's it all about? Culture. Penguin scales is all about culture. So I investigated what the culture is in the rural areas in Southern Africa with regards to penguins. Is there a problem with local cultural use of penguins in South Africa? So a student of mine, Abu Bola, did her master's degree and we looked at a number of the um, cultural tribal areas in, in South Africa and if you think 92 sightings from 343 respondents interviewed, it's quite high. How many people in this room have seen a live painting? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, that's quite good. That's, re that's higher than out of the normal public. I reckon the normal public in this country is less than 1%. But it's used quite heavily in the cultural regions. And if you take the vendor, for example, high number of respondents where penguin populations are high. So they are seen quite frequently <coughs> in rural areas. So what are they? <coughs> um, if we look at a traditional healer and we ask, well, what do they use it for? Well, they grind it up and they, and they rub it into wounds on their arm and it can scare away evil or protect you from evil. Um, it, it's, it's used wherever you go. The one chap gave us a scale and said he's bulletproof. He just puts a scale in his pocket and he considers himself completely bulletproof. This is the cultural belief system. What was actually interesting and somewhat scary is we just thought it was scales, but it's not. Fresh produce, meat, blood and fat is also used to treat a huge number of ailments within local culture in this country. However, what was refreshing is very little bits are used. Very small amounts, two or three grams at a time. So uh, one pangolin skin can keep a traditional healer in that whole region with a supply for 10 years. So that means that the trade in, in for cultural use in South, South Africa and a similar study in, in Botswana was carried on is not of concern to us. If we look at tribal use, it's ancient. King George 
was presented with a coat in 1820. A, a war helmet, a uh, cultural war helmet from the Democratic Republic of Congo, Genghis Khan's era, and this in Borneo, this was a ninth species of pangolin, the Bornean pangolin was a huge animal. It was about 20 kilograms. Went extinct within the last 100 years purely because it was harvested for, its ca for scales for a traditional tribal uh, dress for their army. So, you can overuse something to its extinction. Let's take the Shona people and the Sisulu people of, of Zimbabwe and South Africa. It's the greatest gift you can bestow upon a tribal leader or a chief. It is estimated that Robert Mugabe got in excess of 200 pangolins on his inauguration. You take a pangolin out of its natural habitat, out of its home range, it's dead. It doesn't feed in captivity. You can't feed it in captivity. And it suffers tremendously psychologically in the trade. So the pangolin population in northern KwaZulu Natal is pretty much extinct, maybe one or two individuals. We've got a project now, and that's why my executive director, Nikki Wright, couldn't join us today. She's transporting four pangolins from our hospital down to KwaZulu Natal as we speak to repopulate a locally extinct population. So these are the type of things we're involved with. We're involved with the local community down there, the Zulu people, to say we want to bring your culture back, but you can't harvest it out of the wild. You've got to respect it in your culture and leave it where it is. These are the, the fights we're fighting at the moment. Other things that we have to change with the government legislation, and legislation is critical, is these bottom strands of electric fence are pangolin killing machines. We lose between 500 and 1,000 pangolins in South Africa every year being electrified on these bottom electric fence strands. These strands are at the perfect height that these Tamex brown pangolins are bipedal. They're the only pangolins that walk on two legs. Others all walk on all four. And they hit that bottom strand with their soft underbelly. They curl around it, which is a natural defense mechanism. And that pulse comes through every seven or eight seconds until the pangolin's dead. And it's a cruel, horrifying death. It probably takes about half an hour to be electrified to death. Um, this is a little baby called Electra that we took off her electrified a mom not too long ago. So we went into other parts of Africa. We did a study in West Africa in the Gulf of Guinea, looking at Sierra Leone uh, <coughs> and Ghana. And we looked at the cultural use of pangolins in West Africa, uh, in particular the tree pangolins, the two little white-bellied and the black-bellied tree pangolins, which are arboreal pangolins that live in the trees. And they sold on the side of the road. It's been within the African culture for thousands of years. Um, it's quite expensive for those people. It's 20 US dollars a pangolin. That's a lot of money if you consider the average wage of a Ghanaian or a Sierra Leone person is about one US dollar a day. So it's, it's, it's effluent. It's highly sought after. And they are um, used both in traditional cultural practices and they're used as a source, a delicacy source of meat. But it's, it's a normal thing then. It's a normal thing in Central Africa. Um, and we brought Roman law and we said, now you can't do it anymore. That's a huge problem. So we, we, we're bringing a sort of a westernized society attitude into a, an, an ancient Africa. Um, the problem is, um, and due to modern medicine and other things, the African, pang the African population <laughs> as well as the Asian, Asian population of people has skyrocketed. And <coughs> the cultural use of pangolins in Africa is no longer sustainable. That it, it is what it is. When we chatted to the tribal leaders up there, they were horrified that they may go extinct. That is a huge angle we need to work on. A lot of the police officials, the conservation officials, etc., make use of pangolins. They don't see it being a problem. So the laws are in place, they're not enforced. Policy is not enforced. Um, culture is enforced. So, um, we did a similar study up there. This is a traditional uh, uh, bushmeat market on the side of the road. I call these chaps farmer hunters because uh, during the rainy season or the growing season, um, they have their plantations, whether it's cocoa plantations or <coughs> oil palm plantations, which is another horrifying thing that's happening in the tropical forests of Africa. But outside of the growing season, they become hunters. They're not poachers. They're hunters. They're hunting <coughs> for probably... Uh, the greatest source of protein in Central and West Africa is bushmeat. And they hunt for bushmeat and they sell it. They sell it either at a chop bar, which is on the side of the road that looks like that, those pangolins, these white-bellied and black-bellied pangolins there, 
or this, this guy in the cities and towns has a freezer, so he can trade on a more long-term basis. But we, we see that there's a whole trade movement in Panglands um, from the rural areas uh, into the more urban areas, uh, and there's a demand for the meat. Um, but there's also cultural use. Just like in Southern Africa, they use the cultural uses for pangolins for a number of ailments, both in Ghana and Sierra Leone in our study sites. And they use to treat a huge number of different ailments, um, which could be either spiritual or they could be medical related. Um, so it is within their culture and it is large in their culture. And when we spoke to the leaders and said these animals are going to disappear, and they're going to disappear from your culture. They were really, really visibly horrified. And when they put the word out to their people and their <coughs> communities and their tribal regions, no longer can you use these things because they're going to disappear from our culture. We may very, very well get a better response than policing and locking people up. But this is the type of thing we need to um, check to governments through Africa about and to find a workable solution. You, you can't lock up the whole of Asia and the whole of Africa. We'd, we'd like to sometimes when, we, when us working with pangolins every day and they die in our hands, we get really upset and we, and we suffer heavily emotionally and, and my board and, and my team. But, but um, sometimes you can't just lock everybody up. You've got to educate people. You've got to speak to traditional healers. You've got to speak to traditional leaders. And these are some of the answers that we need to find. So let's get onto the ground and see how this is done. This is the horror. It's the truth of it. it. It's been going on for thousands of years. So you boil the pangolin. You knock it on the head with a panga normally. You boil it for about two minutes to soften up the connection between the scales and the skin. Um, you simply slip the scales off with a sharp knife. They come off quite easy. That's a black belly tree pangolin. It's an adult black belly tree pangolin. And then you viscerate it. You take out the organs, cook it on an open fire, and that's how it's sold. This lies on the side of the road. It's a waste product. Some of it is used for cultural use, but the large majority is a waste <coughs> product and has been a waste product for hundreds of years and has been lying in piles next to these bush meat markets. We know that the Asian people, particularly the Chinese, are very um, uh, heavily involved in Africa now in, in resource mining, <coughs> development, etc., etc. They are quite prominent within Africa, particularly Central and West Africa, and those people would have seen us and they know what it's worth in their culture. And they would have asked these guys, uh, what are you doing with that? No, nothing. Or can I have it? No, sure you can have it, but would you pay me for it? No problem, we'll give you 20 US dollars for a bag. Oh, wow. Uh, okay, well let's make it 50 US dollars. So this is turned. This is turned within the last two to three years. So what used to be a waste product is now a commodity. And this is a very recent turn of events. How have we seen this waste product? We've seen it like that. Lots of, by tons and ton loads. But those are no longer old dried out scales from the bushmeat trade. We're finding fresh scales. So these farmer hunters are now no longer just hunting for protein, they're hunting for scales. So the commodity chain has completely changed over um, the last two to three years. And that's extremely scary. So we've seen some media uh, released out of places such as Malaysia, Vietnam, and China recently with large hauls of pangolins. The majority of these pangolins are Asian pangolins, uh, mostly for markets, meat markets in Vietnam. Um, not so much meat markets in China. China more want the scales, but certainly Vietnam, um, where they are sold and they can't keep up with the amount of numbers. So Asian pangolins are dwindling very, very rapidly. The population in Asia has increased <coughs> dramatically and the demand for meat and scales has increased exponentially along with that trade. And so the Asian pangolins are uh, uh, closing in on the brink of extinction. And so we've seen this trade moving to Africa over the last few years um, exponentially. This is a typical traditional um, shop in mainland China, this one in Hong Kong. I have found literature that dates back to the Chinese dynasties uh, uh, 600 AD um, and uh, 400 AD. I can't find anything longer than that because those are probably in scrolls in museums or within uh, a, a family care within 
uh, Asian people, but it goes back many thousands of years, and it's not going to go away. <coughs> it's not going to go away like the rhino trade is not going to go away. You have to somehow chop off the head of the snake, and unfortunately, that is that uh, cultural thing. So, uh, one of the best angles to do this is educating <coughs> the youth. The Chinese youth are picking up on this. People like Jackie Chan <coughs> have been promoting the protection of penguins very strongly, and but we don't have two decades. I reckon they'll be extinct in two decades. You can go on the internet, you can order scales, you can do it right now off your phone if you like. It's available. Uh, it's available anywhere, anytime, any place. Uh, and it's all about money. And if it's about money, as soon as something gets more protection, as soon as something gets more expensive, it becomes organized crime. And if it becomes organized crime, it goes underground. And when it goes underground, we don't know what's going on anymore. So. Um, we, I have briefed um, the Directorate of um, Crimes in the Hawks in this country and they also recognize that it's becoming stronger and stronger organized crime in South Africa. So there are a number of uses of in, in the illegal trade. We're finding in Europe and North America um, pangolin leather boots. We're finding it in Paris in some um, uh, clothing stores, but not a lot. Uh, the greatest proportion is Chinese traditional medicine. I've identified 60 different commercial products sold commercially, manufactured on a commercial basis <coughs> in China. It's not just pangolin powders in a vial. It's part of an ingredient. So you put five grams of pangolin scales, two grams of tortoise beak or whatever it happens to be um, for a particular ailment. 60 different products and easily available and commercially available. Pangolin feature suit goes for around about two and a half thousand um, US dollars a plate in, in uh, Vietnam and is highly sought after and they can't keep up with the demand. Pangolin trade routes, routes if we're looking at Africa, the eastern seaboard of Africa, Mombasa and Kenya, <coughs> a lot from the Gulf of Guinea. Uh, this year a huge amount of trade ha has been recognized coming from areas such as Uganda and Nigeria which are hotspots. I don't think they're particular hotspots that all the poaching is going on there. I think they are collection points. So you collect all over Central Africa and you move to ports in Uganda and Nigeria and they are shipped out of there. Um, Southern Africa, uh, Maputo is a big export port. We found pangolin <laughs> scales in Richards Bay, Durban Harbour and Cape Town Harbour. We found three incidents <coughs> of pangolin skins in Cape Town alone this year. That's that's three times more than any other occasion of dead pangolins. Well, uh, these are estimated prices, about 10 US dollars per gram. I please ask the audience and our audience online not to share these prices, it fuels the trade. But we're looking at around about 300 uh, rand, South African rands for one skin in this country at, at the moment, 300,000. If you are a destitute parent and you can get your hands on a pangolin, and you can get your hands on a couple of hundred thousand rands, you're going to do it, no matter what the law says. Money talks, especially if you don't have any and your family is suffering. So, if we look at the trade in pangolins, uh, the numbers are a little bit up from Richard's talk. I've added the most recent numbers now. Uh, we're approaching this year 70 tons. So, that is around about 120,000 pangolins this year alone. That's an onslaught that we cannot win. Two decades will all be gone, is my estimate. Um, as Richard said, I don't know if this is new or if it's only what we're picking up. I think it's because we're picking up on it now. I don't think that this is altogether uh, a new trend. However, I do believe the Asian trade has fueled this market and this fire because they can't find the four Afri Asian species. So I think the commodity chain in Africa has changed and the onslaught for pangolin scales is on and it's live and it's brand, brand new. And we need to nip it in the bud as soon as possible. <coughs> it needs policy, it needs le le legislation. We desperately need governments to take notice. The South African government has taken notice and they've taken very serious notice. And you'll hear from Fani Musangu now uh, he just runs all day, him and I are fighting this fight in this country. And um, uh, we've got passionate people like Fani that are on the ground and then fighting this war. But we need to do that in Africa, in the rest of Africa. We need governments 
um, to, to, take, to recognize the problem. The Namibian government is starting to recognize the problem. So is the Botswana government. So is the Zimbabwe government. The Mozambican government, I don't believe, have. Um, a number of other governments have, but we need a, a greater buy-in. We desperately need a greater buy-in. If I just had to pop on the screen some of the countries that gave rise to this, uh, to the figures I've given you now, um, we're looking at Cameroon, Nigeria, the DRC, Ivory Coast, Uganda. Those are hotspots, and it's driven by money. It doesn't necessarily mean all the poaching is going on there. This is what's happening in South Africa right now. Um, we've had 29 cases this year. We've got 10 pangolins in, in my hospital right now. How on earth do you look after 10 pangolins? It's almost impossible. Ask Maria, she works with them every single day. They don't feed in captivity. You've got to walk these animals up to six, seven hours a day per pangolin. You can't ask someone to just come walk a pangolin. He's going to walk away with it. It's 300,000 rand. <laughs> um, with Farney's assistance and that of the government assistance and the Department of Environmental Affairs, the South African Police Service, Stock Theft Unit, Endangered Species Units, we locked up a huge number of people last year. We locked up a huge number this year. Um, you know, it, it, it becomes, uh, we've got huge support in this country at the moment. It never used to be like that, but it's fantastic now. But we work as a collective unit now. All of us, on one boat, in one warship, we work as a unit. If you don't work together as a unit, and you've got the National Prosecuting Authority there, the South African Police Service Stock Theft Unit guys there, Farney EMIs over there, um, and, and advocates, are, it doesn't work. It doesn't come together. It's not coherent, and you don't arrest the guys, and you don't prosecute them sufficiently well, and you don't lock them up. Now that we've come together, we're winning this war as one unit. It's fantastic. So these are just a few figures of what's happening in this country. Um, we 45 cases, 43 cases last year, 29 cases this year. Remember, this is only what we know about. When I speak about 69 tons of scales, remember, that's only what we've caught, what we've intercepted. That's about 10% of the trade. So if we're talking about 69 tons, it's actually 690 tons. It's actually not 1,300 pangolins. It's 1 1.3 million pangolins this year. That's what we don't realize. We're only intercepting a small proportion of the trade. Where are we doing these busts? A few in the Northern Cape. Gauteng is a hotspot. What makes Gauteng unique? Lots of money. On the edge of the game farm areas, um, Nelspreit, um, Bushbuck Ridge, uh, Zanin, Palaboa, Messina. What makes that the red arc? It's a lot of migrant labor. A lot of migrant labor, a lot of migrant labor. People looking for jobs. People trying to make money. Illegal wildlife trade. Pangolin trade. Um, so, Limpopo, 19 cases, Gauteng, 14 cases. This is Nkumbuti. Nkumbuti is the name of African beer. Nkumbuti was cut out of an African beer drum, completely sealed with beer in it, covered in sores from being wet too long. But she's fine. She headed back to Mozambique, crossing through the Kruger Park, a wonderful little pangolin. And um, my, some of my board members are sitting here now. Uh, that'll remember her well. Um, this is Mamelodi. This is how they kept in the trade. Sometimes for his member as long as two weeks, tied up, unable to move. Um, Mamelodi took about 10 minutes to uncurl. She was so stiff. Um, I had five Zimbabweans in my little golf trying to sell me Mamelodi for a quarter of a million rand. And, um, but that's how it happens. And that's, the, and, and that's the ugly side of it that we have to deal with. So they're all pulled out of the illegal trade. Most of them are alive in, the, in South Africa. The, that trend is trading, changing. We found three skins of pangolins this year in Cape Town. It's easier to move with dead animals than live animals. But they all come into our hospital at the Johannesburg Wildlife Veterinary Hospital for treatment. Sometimes they're there for months. Sometimes they're there for a week or two. Um, we've learned a hell of a lot. We've lost a hell of a lot. It costs us about 50,000 rands to treat one. We had 43 last year. Uh, we get no financial support from government. We're a non-profit organization, but this war is extremely costly. Um, and, and to fight this war efficiently, we, we have to have funding, and, and we're in dire need of funding. So we follow the pangolins we release for up to a year post-release because 
they suffer from post-traumatic stress disorder and they collapse after a release. They just think they're back in the wild, they're back in the trade, they're out of their home range, they're in a different country, so we, we look after them very carefully. We're, the one release that we've got going up in the Limpopo Valley in, 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 in the border with Zimbabwe, the pangolin was attacked by uh, a whole family group of hyenas and, and ripped up quite badly, so uh, he's back in hospital. But it's these type of things, you know, um, behind the scene things. It's, it's not easy. It takes six, up to six hours to walk every pangolin foraging every day. Some of them are really hungry, as you can see in this shot, that they just destroy a termite nest. Uh, but eventually um, we get them back, and we get them wild, and we get them released, um, and, and that's the joy of it. Thanks very much, folks. Thank you very much, uh, Prof. Ray. Thank you very much for the very deep and for sharing um, your experience, for sharing what you go through and highlighting the plight of, you know, the poor little pangolins and um, emphasizing that there's a need for a col um, collaborative effort and more effort on all sides to address the issue. Otherwise, um, uh, we might not be able to tell our grandchildren about the pangolin and we might only see them in a museum someday. Um, having said that, I would like to invite our next speaker, Maria Deckman. Um, she is uh, from REST uh, Namibia, and she will share her experience of her daily um, life with the pangolins as well. Thank you. Maria, up to you. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Good, after good afternoon, everyone, or good morning, everyone watching from the Internet. Um, my name is Maria Deckman. I run the Rare and Endangered Species Trust in Namibia. Um, working very closely with the African Pangolin Working Group. I think as Ray said, it's time for all of us to not be working individually. We have a major, major crisis going on in Southern Africa. Well, all of Africa, but our region is Southern Africa. Um, at REST, we actually work, uh, we have five flags, flagship species. Um, we sort of call them the Forgotten Five. And remember, I started this 19 years ago when nobody knew what a pangolin was, nobody cared what a vulture was, um, and certainly frogs and dick dicks and, and snakes were not particularly popular. Um, 19 years on, and I would say that three of those are already listed as highly endangered worldwide, and two of them I think we still just don't know enough about to list them as endangered. So unfortunately, a bit prophetic. But today I'm going to talk about the Cape pangolin, ground pangolin, Cape pangolin, Temex pangolin, every single pangolin, every species seems to have three to five names. Um, so it sort of depends on what you prefer, I think, at the moment. Um, we don't know the population. Um, it is one of eight species and the only one that can handle arid regions. Um, and this is a little bit what Ray talked about, so I'm not going to talk too much about it, but this whole transition from going from an animal that nobody knew anything about to suddenly having conferences and events like this um, and bringing, bringing together some stakeholders because people are starting to learn what a pangolin is. So pangolins are unique in that they went from pretty much listed as uh, non-threatened, um, uh, um, not really considered endangered, to in a very, very short period of time becoming Appendix 1 um, with CITES. And that's usually quite a rare thing. Um, trade. I think uh, Ray, again, handled it pretty, pretty well. But I want to throw some very interesting things I want you guys to remember, OK? A rhino is poached every eight hours. A pangolin is poached every five minutes. So in the time I'm going to give this talk, three pangolins are dead. In the time that this event will take place, we'll probably have about 24 dead pangolins. When you drive to work tomorrow, think of how many pangolins are dying just during your drive. It's a bad statistic. And it's one that, it, it's going to be things like that that's going to, going to attract public attention. Um, and unfortunately, I think the saving grace of the pangolin was it became the most illegally trafficked animal in the world. If it was the second most illegally trafficked animal in the world, we still wouldn't know what a pangolin was. Another thing is, and I mean, this is what the clinic that Ray is working with is, is working on, and, and they've been so, so helpful for us, um, is that all of these other species that we're worried about, and trust me, I love them all, um, have usually been uh, held in captivity, they're breeding in captivity, they're held in zoos, they're wildlife parks that are doing very good jobs with them. Um, with pangolin, this has not occurred. Okay? As far as I know, no Cape pangolin has ever been bred in captivity. All right? 
um, they're not held in captivity. As Ray says, I think probably there's three very, very top organizations in Southern Africa um, working on the rehabilitation of pangolins. Um, and all three of us are really suffering. We have so many losses um, that it's just, it, it's, not even a, it, it's not even a funny situation anymore. Um, and I think um, the, the Johannesburg Clinic is really groundbreaking. Um, and nicely enough, uh, one of their major vets has been sharing her protocols with us, even though she hasn't published her paper, which if you're a scientist, you know is quite rare to show you, share your information. But again, it's collaboration and it's saving pangolins and it's certainly helping us in Namibia save pangolins. Um, and then these seizures. I mean, the seizures are coming in. They're not a couple of tons anymore. They're a couple of thousands of tons now. Um, it's just a very, very bad situation. If you go onto the internet, and I recently did this for another talk I gave, um, because I don't usually Google pangolins, um, every single one of these uh, statistics or facts that comes up is incorrect. Not one of these is right. Um, who came up with how long a pangolin is, a ground pangolin is, is pregnant for? It was 139 days. I have absolutely no idea. Since one has never been bred in captivity, uh, most people don't even know how they mate. Um, I've been fortunate to see it a couple of times, but most of the books are wrong on how uh, Cape pangolins mate. Um, and no one knows gestation. So we don't know some of the fin fundamental, we don't know how old they live. Um, we're only coming up with some of the baseline veterinarian data. Um, you know, they don't shed their scales. Now, apparently there's been a new um, study in China, I don't know if it was done by traffic or who, um, where they actually went around to the population and a lot of the population thought that pangolin scales were naturally falling off the pangolins. So no pangolins were injured in the consumption of this scale. Um, absolutely wrong information. So I'm, I'm fairly confident that it's the trade that's putting out and disseminating some of this information and we need to start getting enough good information out there that the rest of these um, myths are actually starting to, to go away. Um, in Namibia, we have some unique situations. Uh, I think you have, my driver was telling me something, 22 million people in Johannesburg. We have 2.2 million people in our entire country. So we're very isolated. Um, to some extent, I think that's a huge disadvantage because if you have 10,000 uh, hectares, uh, you can do a lot on that 10,000 hectares um, without <coughs> anyone seeing what's going on. There's not going to be a neighbor looking over you. Um, more importantly, there's been a real trend in the last three years for clearing bush. We have a lot of invas invasive acacia. Um, they're bulldozing it. Uh, they're rolling it with like a, almost looks like a steamroller kind of thing or a, a roller that you would use for, for tarring roads. And they're burning charcoal. Okay, so this seems great. Uh, there have been a lot of conferences, you know, a lot of um, uneducated, um, lower income people are, are getting into a, a job and at least having some income. The only problem is most of those jobs are not supervised. So you've got this element of society that doesn't have a lot of money. They're not highly educated. They're in the bush for up to a week alone um, or with their teams and they have access to these pangolins because they're walking around. They're allowed on the property. So they're not poachers. Um, they've got all the tools to break open, um, you know, termite hills and, and any denning um, that pangolins could have or aardvark. Um, and um, nobody's watching what they take out. They're only looking at the consumption of the bush um, or the charcoal at the end of the day, and nobody's looking at actually the, the wildlife that's going out. So I would say that's our biggest problem in Namibia at the moment. Um, and then our law enforcement is definitely trailing South Africa and Zimbabwe. Um, although we're starting to work on it a little bit better, um, we used to do uh, uh, put somebody behind bars and they would have a $400 fine or three days in jail. And I tell you, that gets a little frustrating um, because a lot of work goes into getting that guy into jail for three days. Um, so the police start to lose their motivation. Um, and now uh, our latest one last month got 10 years. Uh, no, 10,000, uh, no, 10 years or 20,000 Namibian dollars um, bail. So it's progressing a little bit. Um, and certainly I think that's a lot of what this is all about. It's about the policy. So we can be in there on the field. Uh, you know, we can be a green scorpion and, and be out there catching the guys. But if the policy is not in place from government, at the end of the day, our work <laughs> is useless. Um, that policy has to be in place. Some of the advantages are it's a little bit harder to get them out. Um, we've got a little bit less inf road infrastructure, but we don't really have the manpower to do roadblocks. Um, luckily, we've got an amazing amount of support from our government at the moment. Um, in the last year, suddenly pangolins are the key word, um, and, and our government's looking for a lot of support. 
Um, and then things like helicopters. It sounds so easy, um, but I think you guys don't pay attention to helicopters. You know, every news channel has a helicopter. You probably have a lot of helicopters in your airspace. If we see a helicopter, everyone comes running out of the house and tries to ID it. Um, so we're quite aware of it. And then on the ground, this is just some of the stuff. For those of you that are making policy, for you, those of you that are in the media, for those of you that want to know a little bit more about penguins, um, we're behind the times. You know, we're still using VHF trackers. Um, we're starting to try and work now with a, a company in South Africa that um, is doing some satellite tracking and some GPS, but they're still big and they're a little bit heavy. And it does appear that our Namibian pangolins might be smaller, uh, whether it's a subspecies, whether it's just because we're a little bit more arid than South Africa. Um, you know, on average, my adult pangolins are, are 8 kgs, and I think on average yours are about 12. Yeah. Um, so we definitely have a disadvantage in Namibia as far as some of the, the development. But if we can put a satellite tracker on a butterfly in this world, certainly we can start to de develop something for pangolins. The reason we haven't is because nobody cared about pangolins. Nobody knew what a pangolin was. And that's why I think, you know, having things at, at the Joburg Clinic, um, having in Zimbabwe, having ourselves um, some pictures of how cute pangolins are, getting people excited about them, getting students about them, get excited about them, investors, donors, um, all the rest of it. But with that, you've got to start doing your research. If you don't have research, in my opinion, you cannot educate properly. And that's some of the stuff. I don't know why I have to keep pushing these buttons. All of this should have come up on its own. Um, but we're finally getting a lot of, of movement data. Um, we are following pangolins for hours and hours and hours and hours every single day. I wish there were more than 24 in a day um, because sometimes it does get a little bit overwhelming. But we're starting to know how much they eat. Instead of sticking our thumb in the air um, and taking guesses, we're finally getting some hard data um, and looking at glucose levels and, and some of the other uh, veterinarian um, protocols. So here's some information. Within 189 do, uh, day period, um, you know, most of them were walking two and a half hours a day. This was during, during the winter um, where they walk a little bit less because it's so dry in Namibia. They're walking a lot of kilometers. They are not walking five kilometers an hour. They're usually on average walking uh, just about a half a half. Um, but a lot of calories burned, and I showed this to a vet, and she said, yes, now I know why they're coming in such bad condition. Um, and that's why, as Ray uh, indicated, our releases are not going well. Um, once we started tracking our pangolins, because the protocols before, up until probably about three years ago, were you got a pangolin, you weighed it, you maybe tried to give it some water, and then you just took it to the most remote area in, around you, and you just released it. And that's what everyone did. And we all patted ourselves on the back and we said, another pangolin released. And once we started putting trackers on it, we started realizing we were losing 80% of those released pangolins. Now, 80% is no joke. So you think you're doing a good job. You're doing an absolutely horrendously horrible job. Um, you've maybe still saved 20% that would have died, but 80% is not a good statistic. Um, once we're following the protocols of the Joburg um, uh, Clinic, um, we're finding just the opposite. Uh, we had a 20% a failure rate, um, and now that those protocols have changed and they've shared them with us, um, our last five rescues have been 100% um, well re uh, released back into the wild, and that's over a couple of months period of time, so we're going to have to see, but usually it's within those six, first six weeks. Stress levels on pangolins. If you see a pangolin in the bush, I say it to every person that comes and visits me, do not pick it up and take a picture with it because uh, you've just almost guaranteed its death. Um, it may appear to be okay and rolled up in a ball while your presenter with a film crew or whatever is, is looking at it and talking about it, um, but it's uh, definitely very, very stressed. And then you've got to look at education. You're a jack of all trades, um, sometimes a master of none. Um, and working with your communities. Um, we started working with the Herreros. Uh, that's one of the Herrero leaders up at the top. He comes out. Traditionally in, in our Herrero culture, if you found a pangolin, very much like Zimbabwe, you took it to the chief, he threw it in the fire, everybody consumed a piece of meat, and you all had good luck. Now the chief comes out, he takes a picture with not a wild pangolin, if we have one on site, a pangolin that I've raised, that's been in captivity for a couple of years because it takes a couple of years to prepare them for the wild. We do have a pangolin now that had a very serious injury. He cannot survive in the wild. So we're allowed under the right circumstances and very, very strict, stringent circumstances to let these guys hold them. They take a picture, they go back to their community, and they say to their community, we now have a picture of a pangolin which brings much more power than that meat. 
So he's saying to his community, leave the pangolins in the wild, because if you bring them to me, we're going to defeat the power of this picture. So whether you believe that there's power in that picture or not is irrelevant. The chief believes it, his followers believe it, his community believes it, and now instead of me or somebody else coming and trying to impose law on them, the chief is actually imposing law on his own community, and it's much, much more successful. And then these are sometimes some of the, sh the shape they come in. Uh, they've got broken legs. Um, the poachers will often try to pull them out of the hole. A pangolin biologically will, will tighten himself in that hole, um, so they come in with broken legs. Um, tube feeding is essential. Postmortems are absolutely vital because what's happening in Namibia, and I'm sure it's happening in South Africa too, is you go to the average vet, he's never even seen a pangolin. He has absolutely no idea how to tube this animal. He doesn't realize the reflexes. He, he, a pangolin is not a regular mammal. Um, so everything that you know about tube feeding any other mammal is going to be 100% different for a pangolin. Um, so it's just a matter of educating it, uh, educating the people. And, and every time you do a postmortem, you start learning where you're going to find that vein so that you can collect blood um, and all sorts of things like that. So we're breaking ground at the moment. And I don't mean we rest. I mean we pangolin organizations in southern Africa are breaking ground. Um, Vietnam's been ahead of us, I think, for a long time from a veterinarian point of view. Um, but our pangolins are much harder. I'll, I'll argue it to my death. Um, I think Asian pangolins are much easier to rehabilitate. Um, but by far the Cape pangolin is the hardest that we know of. Maybe the giant too, I don't know. Um, but we're breaking ground um, in South Africa, in Namibia, um, and in Zimbabwe. Um, and as Ray said, it costs money. And I put this up here, not because I expect all of you to start donating to all of us, but it gives you an idea of, of what it's costing. You know, they've already got a clinic. My clinic's just been registered. I don't even have an operation table yet. Um, so suddenly my government is asking me, because we're the only rehab center in Namibia, to do all of these pangolins. And I've had, you know, I used to have four a year. I had four in the last month. So, you know, I, I'm not at 58 yet, uh, but I'm, I'm getting very close to that. And, you know, my staff and myself just, we're, we're working ourselves really, really hard. But it's not only the clinic. You've got to look at security. We, as centers, have not worried about security, I think. I mean, I don't know about Ray, but, you know, when there's, when there's animals to get tracking on and when there's people that you've got to pay to, to, to walk them and, you know, you're just looking at trying to keep these animals alive, you're not worrying about security. And the day is going to come, and I think the day is going to come just around the corner where somebody's going to break into one of our places and they are going to cause some big trouble for all of us, um, not only for the animals that we're working with, but for potentially for our people. So please, you know, if any of you do have contacts, there are organizations that are starting to need a lot of money because we've all been working on nothing. And that works for a long time, but now suddenly the pangolin is the it animal, and we're still all working on budgets that are not nearly comparable to any of the other species um, in the same situations or even better situations than ours. And then, of course, you know, as I'm sure is with their center, um, you know, anything that you put into a center, whether it's manpower or equipment or whatever, is helping a number of other animals too, um, and a number of very other important species. Um, we have a duty um, to, to keep this, this, this generation. And I, I don't know, Ray says 20 years. I've heard between two and 10 years, and the Cape pangolin will be extinct. Um, because I don't think the rate that it's going out now is going to continue. I think it's going to get worse before it gets better. So I think the rate that it's going out is going to increase. Um, I think we don't even know our populations. We've got zero idea what our populations are. Um, and, and I think they're going to go very, very quickly. And I think it's going to be a big, big loss um, for our region. Um, this is an amazing animal. And just studies being done on what it consumes for ants and termites has a huge effect on your farming communities. Um, so I won't go into that, but this is a vital animal for our environment. It's not just a cool, pretty animal. I'm going to show you just a video quickly. Um, it came out just before the eye of the camera, um, and it's just showing a little bit about... How do I do volume? This We've is got. a pangolin. The world's only truly scaly mammal. We know almost nothing about their lives, but these creatures have gained an unfortunate tag. Pangolins are the most trafficked wild mammals in the world. A hundred thousand pangolins a year are hunted and trafficked like this. 
more than 4,000 pangolins were killed to collect the nearly three tons of scales. Their scales and their meat have become lucrative commodities. For as much as $500 a kilo. More valuable than ivory. Fried pangolin, grilled pangolin, steamed pangolin. This shy creature may become extinct before most people even notice it's there. Conservationist Maria Diekman is on a mission to save these vulnerable animals. There's not a chance this pangolin will be alive a week from now if I can't save it. Her journey will take her halfway around the globe to Vietnam, Thailand, and China into the very heart of the problem. And there are probably 50 to 100 in each of these bags. Now she'll discover a shared determination to save an animal that we're still trying to get to know. We've got a very good chance of losing penguins within the next decade. We're talking about a total and complete extinction. They're the underdogs. And I gotta fight for the underdogs. Just like I the Penguin. I mean, what an amazing show that was. That reached Africa. This still hasn't shown in Africa, if you can believe it. It's shown around the world, but it hasn't shown yet in Africa. Whereas I, I the Penguin actually hit our African market, and I think that's vital. So if any of you have any connections in this room <coughs> to keep bringing the word Penguin out to Southern Africa, please do so because it's very, very vital. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Maria, for sharing your experience. And surely, I think the aim, as it mentioned in the video, we are trying to save an animal that we are still trying to know. And I think one of the important stats that will remain with us, I think, would be definitely that one pangolin is perched every five minutes. And for the length of your talk, we can imagine how many have gone already. Um, Thank you once again, and thank you and once again for showing that um, what collaborative efforts can achieve and success, what it means when people work together like Ray so, um, and yourself. Um, having said that, I would like to invite um, Fanny uh, Masango to come and tell us what it's like uh, a day in the life of an environmental management um, inspector that chases the bad guys, what it's like you deal with the conservation aspect of it and you also deal with the criminal that perpetuate the trade. And uh, with that, I would like to invite you to share your experience. Thank you so much. Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, please excuse my voice, is a bit gravelly today. I don't know what's going on, but yeah. <coughs> My name is Fanny Masango. I'm a specialized biodiversity officer. I work for the state. Um, I work for a unit called Biodiversity Enforcement. What we do is we do um, you know, wildlife-related investigations, compliance and enforcement-related stuff. So um, I would like to also share a little bit of uh, where am I coming from. You'll understand why I'm, like, I need to share that. So. I am Debele from Gwandebele, Southern Debele from Gwandebele in Pumalanga. That's where I grew up. And um, my, both my parents are still alive. And how did I fall in love with wildlife? Um, from a very early age, I used to go and pick up everything that crawls and moves from outside. And my mom would shout at me like crazy, bring it inside the house. And she later realized that, you know what, I beat this kid up and I shouted at him, but it just doesn't go away, you know. So why am I saying, why is it important that I say this? Um, we, we all know that sometimes us, as the African community, we do not pay much attention to wildlife per se. 
So why is it important to allow kids to, to you know, like, look, look at the kid. What, what is it that they love? That could actually um, help them in, 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 in contributing greatly, you know, in the country. I have uh, strong reasons to believe that I'm contributing greatly in the, in the protecting and then the, yeah, ensuring the, like the survival of our wildlife. Why is, I've got my mom to thank for that. Because he imprinted in, and instilled this love for, for nature and wildlife in me. Now, with that <clears throat> being said, I would like to also, you know, say to you guys that, to me, this whole thing, um, uh, me, what I'm doing right now, it's more of a calling than a career. Yes, I went to school, I went to varsity for it, but it's more of a, a, a calling than a career. Right, um, I'm going to talk to you about my day-to-day -day experiences, what we encounter, the challenges that we come across as we work in. My first pangolin rescue was in 2015, it was in Kempton Park, it was an ordinary day, uh, chasing after old tannies with uh, tortoises in their backyards. Then all of a sudden I receive a call from an informer saying to me, no man. There's someone trying to <clears throat> send me a live pangolin. That was in Kempton Park. And then I'm like, what is a pangolin? Then I recall that, no, man, I used to see these things in varsity where, um, through uh, videos. I've never seen a live one. We used to go on excursions for two weeks. I started in TUT. We used to go uh, um, to excursions for two, three weeks. I've never encountered one. We'll sleep out there in the wild, but I've never encountered one. Even growing up, I'm coming from rural areas. It's mountainous. I've never encountered one like life like that. Then I went there. That was the f that animal that day when we rescued that animal. It touched my heart. You can ask Prof. I always tell him that story. That that was the day I fell in love with this animal, and I devoted myself to to say that I will always go out there and fight for this animal. Now, what was disappointing, but actually, I will get to that. I'll get to that just now. So now, I, I want to quickly jump into policies. Policies, I would like to also mention that they've, they've mentioned that the ordinance is pretty old. The ordinance still have got uh, fines, 300 rands fines in some areas. The Gauteng Nature Conservation Ordinance, 12th of 1983. Of which the pangolin also from I mean it's also listed in that in 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 in, in that uh, particular uh, act. So you 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 can see that we've got little to work with now. The number is the best tool that we we can actually work with because we, as we all know that we've got ten million a fine not exceeding ten million or jail sentence not exceeding ten uh, ten years. Or put such a fine and, and the thing, uh, put such a fine and the uh, and the sentence. Now criminals laugh at us. If you go, if you're gonna go and and, 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 and issue a fine, we've got an option of issuing a person a fine. Then you say I'm issuing you a, a fine of 300 rands. They're like, oh, okay, by all means. Now they tried to to um, speak to a number of magistrates to sign off on a new like new fine system. So they've sort of upscaled the, the fines. But it's still ridiculous. If you can check the, the amount that these guys are asking for when they are selling these pangolins. It, it, I mean, the fines have gone to 4,500. They're making way more than that. What is 4,500 to someone who's asking for a million? Because they, it means that they've got a lot of money from uh, previous um, you know, sales that they've had. Now, <clears throat> when, I sp when I'm still on policies, like I said, I'll speak about my day-to-day job so we need tools as officials like i i work with ray and other multi like stakeholders like your saps k9 unit your your uh, organized crime unit in our policy we've, we've got a problem as us as green scorpions because I'm, I'm with the Houting green scorpions our policy hasn't it doesn't have provisions for us to use blue lights i i i i want to I want you guys to understand why it is necessary for us to have such things. And you know that in South Africa, if something is not stated in a police, in, a, in some form of a formal document, a police whatsoever, you'll never get that. Now we're struggling. We, we, <clears throat> we're driving on, on highways, in our own private cars sometimes, even, even the state, uh, uh, state vehicles. We've, we've got no blue lights to stop people. However, the X says we can stop and search people. Ne? Stop any vehicle, any vessel and search people. You go on a highway, you see that, that that's uh, 
a lion cage or that cage based on my experience i know that they normally carry pangolins in that thing how do i then stop a person here? how am i gonna um, rescue that animal so those are the type of of of, of challenges that we are uh, facing and uh, like our colleagues have been emphasizing if there's anyone that can assist in actually ensuring that we get all the tools that we need uh, stated in a policy for instance the blue light like i mentioned now um still on policy something that i need to emphasize we we have a serious problem we are not gonna win this while we're still working in silos um yes i had my po my colleagues uh, have spoken about the uh, cooperation and all that but we still have got a long way to go i would really like to tell you that you see I have never seen such beautiful collaboration between this particular team in Gauteng as Prof. Ray and, and specific individuals in these specific units. It's not something that is there on a policy that everyone knows that, you know what, this is the route that I need to follow. We personally built this bond. This team that Prof. Ray was referring to, it's something that was personally built. But there's, there's not even one document that actually forces us as multi-stakeholders or interested parties to work together. So we need such polit policies to force us to be, I mean, to work together. You understand? Sharing of intelligence. We share intelligence amongst ourselves there are other people you can ask prof Ray. i am responsible in the in the green scorpions part responsible for 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 pangolins in Gauteng. and prof ray is a champion of, of pangolins there's an uh, a sop from the national department of environmental affairs that states that all pangolins must go to african pangolin working group in affiliation with uh, uh, the Johannesburg veterinary hospital now he can he can vouch for me there's other pangolins that we do not know um where they came from but you hear that uh, there was a pangolin rescued uh, in this place and that place it was taken to a particular hospital where did it end up no one knows is there a court case no court case now the reason why i want to emphasize cooperation is because there, there is a chain of custody this team that prof Ray has been busy talking about between us and the, and the, and the other mentioned stakeholders we've been so good to, to an extent that we haven't lost any case based or due to um, technicalities now if we do not work together how are we going to ensure that the next person in the other region for instance in bronco spread knows how to actually tighten up those cracks you know i mean close those cracks that could could be you know picked up as technicalities in court because minor technicalities in the chain of evidence can throw the court i mean the the case out of court of which now it means that we're not winning we're wasting our time we're going out there we're saving these animals however there's no justice served now we are working in silos we need policies that are actually going to force us as interested or law enforcement agencies to work together force us that is this thing of of me forming partnerships with this one and that one what if they are not available who is going to assist me in the canine unit if that week is not available you see right um okay i've touched that and yeah, I mean, uh, my pleas and outcries to, 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 to the policymakers out there. Look, it doesn't help to have good watertight and airtight uh, acts and policies, but the, the execution or the execution of it or the application, let me, let me rather say application of it, it's just not right. We've had p people, uh, yes, it, it, it's current better, but some of these sentencing it really doesn't make sense to me we've had people i can uh, give you an, an example i know we're focusing on the pangolin we've, we've had a person that we we followed got intelligence from 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 northwest followed that person to sell two lion cubs in in in, in pretoria it was intelligence that was being uh, uh, gathered that was being built guess what that person got a five thousand rand fine He's a whole warrant officer in the SAPS, working in the border. And that's where he picked up those lions. Now tell me, uh, as, as a magistrate, how do you give such a person such a ridiculous uh, punishment? What is 5,000 if this person can drive all the way in the border of, of Botswana and, and, and South Africa, coming into Houting to sell two lion cubs? We've had people that we've caught in pangolin cases previous pangolin cases undocumented um foreign nationals 
proven that they are undocumented, yet they got bail. How to explain? How to explain that? Guess what? Those people fled uh, the, the the country. They know where to be found. I've got two in my Kempton Park case. Two of them gone. Know where to be found. Where are you going to get those people? Unverified address. Just said number sixteen seventy five uh, in Winnie Mandela in Tembisa. They don't verify that. They take his word for it. They go. They release him. <clears throat> They call the following day to go and verify the address. There is no such an address. So how do you then do that? We've got, I can assure you right now, the number act. Yes, I, we've got the ordinance, but the good thing about uh, about our act is that we are allowed to use the, 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 the number act as well. So when it comes to any animal, that's my approach. When it comes to any animal that is listed under number, I don't even look at the ordinance because it's an old, outdated act. I don't touch it. I only touch it for petty crimes. Like I said, if if, if he's an old Danny with a tortoise in his backyard, I will I will, I will visit the, the 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 ordinance because it's just minor. It's a petty crime, you know. But if it's an animal that is listed under number, I don't even look at it because I know that number it's 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 strict and very harsh. But like I said, it doesn't help to have such a watertight um, act. But the, the the application thereof you know it's, it's it just doesn't make sense so with that being said i i i, I really feel like we we really need to engage our npa with our npa and train them and tell i feel like there's still a long way to go because sometimes you know you build a case for 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 for, for four weeks you get there and then you say but it's just an animal what, what is this animal anyway they don't even know about it the, so there was a there was a prosecutor that said straight to my face that said to me i've got murder cases to deal with you bringing me cases about some animal so you can see that we also need you know a lot of awareness you know that we need to to, to send out there and then um, with that being said i would i would really really like to recognize uh, this following organizations the um, sapsk9 unit um african pangolin working group the chinese Peck veterinary wildlife hospital stock theft unit unit us as the green scorpions there's only like six of us for the entire province we're responsible for the entire county so you can imagine we we basically are the main custodians of biodiversity but there's only six of us so without these other stakeholders how we, how are we going to do it how so this is also an outcry i i i hope um the right person right person out there is watching this webcast to understand that we are very frustrated and if it wasn't for organizations like this trust me we're gonna have problems i work for the provincial environmental affairs that makes it our responsibility as the provincial environmental affairs to look after the environment of this country this hospital that uh, APWG have with um, the, the Johannesburg Wildlife Hospital, actually the government should be having that. Am I not right? The government should be having such a facility. We should have our own specialists like Prof. Ray. But we don't. So that is why I would like to, you know, thank these guys. You know, without them, we, 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 yeah, we are fighting and losing but like it's we, we will we will not get where we're going now go, going back a little bit to the sharing of the information if you look at the number of live pangolins that are recovered or rescued here in um in Gauteng, or okay let me rather say in south africa as opposed to the scales that are intercepted out there you can tell that we still have a long way to go because it just doesn't balance we rescue four pangolins if you check those scales it's just way more than that now there's another trend when it comes to going back again to the sharing of information there's a trend all these pangolins that we're recovering in Gauteng, there's not even a single person that said i i, I picked it up in in uh, in Mahalisberg. no they're coming from other provinces they don't even know those other provinces where are these guys get, getting these things some of these guys know that there's a pangolin that is en route to Gauteng, but they never tell us. We once rescued a pangolin, and then we'll, we, we, we got to learn at a later stage that someone in Limpopo knew about that pangolin coming to be sold into Gauteng. Why didn't you tell us? No explanation. How are we going to win 
this war if we're working like that, if that's how we, we're going to carry ourselves. We're just not going to win it. So, um, yeah, I... Yeah, no, another thing that I'd also like to add is that I, believe, I strongly believe that in this industry, or, yeah, in our line of work, people need to be hired based on passion. People can go to varsity and get qualifications just for the sake of having a qualification and getting money. Why am I saying this? That's exactly the reason why we've got corrupt officials in our borders. It's because they are in it for the money. They don't have the passion. I just made an example right now about a cop that is supposed to be safeguarding our borders, but it's the very same person that smuggled lions from Botswana into South Africa. Now, people get into professions just for the sake of getting a profession, you know. So, passion, I think, should be something that should be greatly screened when you're going to, you know, join such uh, an industry. So, um, not all hope is lost. I know that we're not really doing enough for the pangolin currently in terms of rescuing them, but... Us and Prof. Ray and, and, and everyone that I normally work with, we normally say one animal at a time. That is what is important to us. That one animal that we rescue, we celebrate like we've rescued a million pangolins. That's just how we operate. Um, yeah, um, that's where my verbal um, presentation goes. I would like to go through a couple of pictures um, with you guys um, just to show you what we do on our day-to-day -day basis. I will just say a couple of words uh, with every slide that um, I, I, I bring in. So this is, was a, um, a rhino. That's a, a, a female rhino with her, um, her baby poached in one of the nature reserves. And we normally come in to do the necropsy. The necropsy is it's when we, you know, it's, it's basically an autopsy for animals. So we extract your, 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 <coughs> your bullets from the animals, for, then go and check for fingerprints or any links to a particular firearms or whatever, or specific firearm that is. So this is a bullet lodged in. This is where, uh, this is actually a, an entry wound of the animal. The bullet didn't exit, so we had to cut it open to get it to extract it, that is. So yeah, this just shows the bullet itself. Then these um, are leopard skins. We've got a serious problem with uh, traditional healers when it comes to these things. Now, as a department, we've, we, we, okay, not, not specifically my department, the Department of Environmental Affairs embarked on a, on a campaign to educate the Traditional Healers Association these guys, I know we've got traditions and all that. I attended that particular workshop. These guys were told that we are not against the fact that you're using these things, but there's this thing called sustainable utilization. Don't go out there and enhance and these things, you know. Uh, as Envelo, as KZN Wildlife, I know that they've got some arrangement with their chiefs. I've, I've heard that, look, if, if a leopard died, you know, they can come and, 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 and use such a skin than to go out and hunt you know these animals this is very wrong this was this person was arrested T it, she tried to explain this but we just pointed to the laws it this is what the law says we understand you're a traditional healer and all that but this is what the law says we need to actually send out the message um okay this is just another one of it so now why did I put this picture here? This is unfair to the animal. This is what was a dehoning. This is not a post rhino we were dehoning it to save it from poachers. Is that fair, guys? This thing naturally is supposed to be there on the rhino. It's supposed to be there on the rhino. Now, in order for us to save it, we have to resort to cutting it off of its face. Imagine you having to, to, to have four of your fingers uh, chopped off just because you're trying to save you. We really, really need to look at such things. I, 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 
look i know it's for it's for the it's for the benefit of the animal but it, it hurts me every time because we have to go and monitor uh, the dehorning every time i go there it just it 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 it, 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 it kills me up inside to say that now we have to you know put this animal through this i'm sure uh, uh, they probably feel naked without their horns but we have to we just have to do it to, in order for us to save them and then this uh okay let me go to the next photo <laughs> this is us we had just raided uh, a multi market in 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 johannesburg it's difficult guys Bec why is it difficult because um okay i'm not gonna go there but going into that place is a problem you need a, a, a huge team because at some point they they, they threatened us we were told that we, you know what we think we're gonna start pulling out guns and they mean it when they say so we were a huge group but before we knew it we were surrounded okay we read it here why is this picture here we we know that our pangolins are okay mainly they they en route to 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 asia but we are also also culprits as south africans when it comes to 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 this declining numbers of the pangolins traditional use this the amount of scales that was uh, recovered here you'll be shocked very extremely extremely shocked okay this uh, okay no, I'll, I'll go and this, as you can see with the previous picture i'm wearing a bulletproof vest so it shows to you we, we, we took there were journalists that were with us they had to wear bulletproof because we knew what we like what we were getting ourselves into so this was also recovered from a traditional healer uh, it's still an ongoing case as well, but you, you can imagine. So this person told us clearly that I bought these things from from um, Faraday, from Faraday Multi Market. If you can walk into that place, you will cry. I promise you. There's monkeys, there's lions, full my, lion, lion mouse, everything, from creepy crawlies to megafauna. There's everything there. So we do not really need to focus on our Asian people and forget our own people. We also need to work with our own people. Look, I understand uh, it has been explained that for traditional purposes, this thing has been used. There are pangolins that are electrocuted, that die naturally. Probably there's scales that are picked up. You can make arrangements with your lo local nature reserves or your, no your local authorities to say that we utilize these things. Then to go out there and push them. We cannot use... Uh, we cannot necessarily use tradition as an excuse to 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 to, 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 to kill our animals. We cannot. There's means and ways. That's why I say I am for sustainable utilization. I didn't say people shouldn't use their things. I'm not against any cultural beliefs. However, we need to focus on sustainable utilization. There was a truck that we intercepted from the entry. Entry. I'm not surprised when uh, uh, studies show that. Um, in the northern case at N, the pangolins were like near extinct. The scales that we, we had roadblocks, we normally hold roadblocks. The, 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 the amount of pangolin carcasses, such carcasses that we, we retrieved from that truck, full truck, full of pangolins and other animal species. So we need to sit down and say that, oh, look, it's, it's tradition. We can do as we please. No, guys, no, no. This is just a photo of how this, in, in this particular image, um, Prof, is it okay if I mention the amount that they were asking? Yeah, we just say we don't spread it out the room. Yeah, please. These guys asked for 1.1 million. These prizes, to show that this thing is organized and they know exactly what they are doing. How do you get to that prize if it's something that you just picked up? And, I mean... If I would come to you with something that I don't know if it has value or not, I would ask you how much would you buy it for? But if, yes. So if I'm coming to you, I'm telling you that I want 1.1 million, it means I know exactly what I'm doing, you know. And then what Prof had just spoken about, it's the same case. This was recovered in this guy's uh, cast. So you see, they know exactly what they are doing. Right, guys, with that slide, I would like to thank you very much for inviting me.
Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Fani, for sharing your experience. Thank you for the work that you do, putting out your life um, for uh, for the for the animals that many people do not know about and that many don't see as valuable. Uh, thank you once again for the dedication and uh, and in the line of your work. And like you say, I think what we can take from your presentation is one animal at a time, and then hopefully we'll be able to to move it through. And also we've seen, uh, thank you for bringing out the organized criminal aspect, that it is an organized criminal network. And uh, it's whether we speak about rhino horn, when we speak about organized criminal network, we usually focus on rhino horn, we usually focus on ivory, but the pangolins as well, pangolin scales, <coughs> leopard skin, giraffes, and the likes are also um, fueling the trade as well. So thank you very much for that. Um, with this, I would like to thank our speakers, our panelists. Thank you very much for sharing your experience. Thank you for enlightening the audience. Um, and with this, I would like to say to the online audience, um, thank you for joining us. And we will be, we will be now moving into a Q&A session, which will be under Chatham uh, House rules. And with that, we will move into the Q&A session. Thank you. <laughs>